A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members of Shalom Baptist Church. It's been a while since I last recorded a sermon online, uh, but alas, we've come full circle, and this week we have been forced once again to bring you uh, the sermon uh, online. Now, this is, of course, not the ideal situation. We would love to be in church. We would love to meet each other. We would love to have a, a fellowship with one another. But the COVID situation in Singapore has uh, worsened a little bit. And, of course, uh, the government has laid out some new uh, restrictions. And because of that, uh, we thought it wise uh, to bring the sermons to you online until the situation has gone down and the, uh, uh, the severity of the situations have gone down and the restrictions uh, have been lifted. Now, uh, I'm sure some of you uh, are, are finding it difficult perhaps to adjust once again to these measures, but nevertheless, we thank God uh, for the many mercies that He has showered upon us. We thank God for His safety, we thank God for His care for us, and uh, we thank God uh, that we are able to hear His Word uh, even from the comfort of our own homes. But this morning, uh, even as you're at home, whether, wherever you are, whether you're at home or uh, watching this sermon from somewhere else, uh, my prayer is that you will take your mind off the mundane things of the world, the day-to-day -day cares of this world, and that you will uh, focus your mind uh, on the things of God, that you will focus your mind on the Word of God, uh, and that you will uh, pay attention to the sermon uh, just as if you were in church uh, this morning. Now, before we go to the sermon for today, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Most High God, we thank you for even allowing us to bring the sermon to God's people, Lord, to your people. Uh, Lord, we thank you for technology that has allowed us to reach people uh, even from afar. And Lord, uh, although the situation, the COVID situation is worsening in different parts of the world, although we see it worsening in Singapore, uh, we know, Lord, that you are still in control of the situation. We know, Lord, that you still care for your people, that you still uh, know the number uh, of hairs that are upon each of our heads, and that you're still in control. And Lord, we pray that you will give us uh, that joy and that peace that can come only from you. And today, Lord, this morning, as, we bring, as I bring God's word to uh, God's people, Lord, I pray that the words that I bring forth be not my words, but thine. Be with each and every one of us, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The title for this morning's message is stunted growth stunted growth billy sunday used to say that if we christians were as physically uh, were as weak physically as we are spiritually uh, we would all need crutches in the physical world stunted growth uh, is very evident it's very clear that someone has uh, an issue uh, with growth and often it's a medical concern uh, there are many reasons for stunted growth in individuals and uh, folks that suffer from it usually suffer from it because of hormone deficiencies uh, hyperthyroidism uh, or a whole host of other medical problems it is a tough condition to have, but many who have it uh, know they have it, and they seek uh, treatment, medical treatment for their conditions. Uh, we are often surprised when we see our children uh, grow physically, or rather we are often not surprised when we see our children grow physically. Uh, in fact, if they didn't grow, it would be a cause uh, for concern. But sadly, when it comes to our physical lives, um, we don't expect Christians to grow so much. In fact, when we see a Christian growing spiritually, uh, when we see a spiritual Christian, uh, most Christians are, in fact, impressed and surprised. Uh, they look at that spiritual Christian uh, as an exception. Uh, he must be a great man. Uh, he must be a, 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 a very spiritual sort of guy, and he must be special, and so on. You see, much of modern Christianity... Uh, looks at stunted growth in the spiritual life more as a norm uh, than something to be concerned about. It is normal for a baby when it is newly born uh, to behave like a baby. It's normal for a toddler uh, to behave like a toddler. In fact, sometimes it's even endearing. Uh, but when a grown man behaves like a toddler, it's no longer endearing. In fact, it's worrying. 
As a preacher, I come across new believers from time to time, and they ask questions that you would expect them to ask. Uh, simple questions, and oftentimes it's a joy for me uh, to answer those questions. Uh, questions we've all had at some point. Honestly, they are uh, quite endearing, and uh, sometimes you hear the same uh, questions being asked by different young Christians, and uh, it's always a joy to see them wanting to know more about the Lord, about uh, fellowship with Him, and so on. But uh, the, fact, the, 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 the sad thing about this is that sometimes a preacher hears the same sort of questions uh, from someone who's been a Christian for 10 years. Uh, and in those instances, his, his questions or his statements are no longer enduring. They are, in fact, worrying. In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4, and verse 14 and verse 15, the scripture reads that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You see, God intends for us to grow out of babyhood. He wants us to grow so much that he has provided us with pastors, uh, with teachers, and he does not want us to always remain as children. Uh, it's very interesting when you think about it that God prioritizes the growth of his children so much, the spiritual growth of his children so much, uh, that he has place for, the, for his children, uh, pastors and teachers to watch over them, to lead them, to guide them, to teach them. Uh, this is one of God's greatest priorities in the life of a Christian. Uh, he does not want us to always remain as children. In fact, God's design of the spiritual life very much mirrors his design of the physical life. And yet it seems like many believers just aren't growing. And even if they are growing, they are growing at a microscopic rate. We are told that we have to be born again, uh, but the spiritual life only begins at the point of being born again. Today we are going to see why many Christians fail to grow spiritually. We are going to see why uh, with so many uh sermons preached with so many lessons taught, why Christians struggle to grow spiritually, why we have Christians who behave uh, sometimes the same way or have the same understanding uh, they had, uh, you know, after 10 years or 20 years of being a Christian. Sometimes you look at believers and you, you ask yourself, is this all the Christian uh, life has to offer? Is this all the, 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 the Bible uh, life has to offer? And we realize that's not it. It is just our lack of growth. Number one, we fail to grow as believers because we fail to drive out the growth inhibitors. We fail to drive out the growth inhibitors. In the book of Joshua, in chapter 17 and verse 12 to verse 15, uh, we come across an interesting passage. In the book of Joshua, in chapter 17 and verse 12 to verse 15, the scripture reads, Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Yet it came to pass, when the children of Israel were waxen strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto? And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Last week, we talked about the victorious Christian life. Uh, 
We talked about failing to recognize the promises of God. We talked about we talked we talked about failing to realize uh, the presence of God and failing to obey the pro procedures and instructions uh, that God has given us. Uh, we, we we talked about how victory was guaranteed for a Christian who would just have faith and claim those victories uh, by following the instructions of Almighty God. Uh, but today we're going to look at another passage in the same book, the book of Joshua. Now at this point, you have to understand that the Israelis uh, had already crossed the Jordan. They had it, uh, they had in essence conquered the land that God had promised them, but they had a problem. Uh, they felt that they didn't have enough space. I mean, Lord, you promised us a good enough land for us to thrive and grow in, uh, but it seems like it's not enough. But the solution to their problem was there all along. You see, now the Israelites had crossed uh, the River Jordan. In, in, in essence, they uh, were conquerors. They were the conquering, they were the victors, and of course the, uh, uh, those that were there, the Canaanites and many of the other uh, groups were subject to them. Uh, they were living in captured land. Uh, but there was a problem. Uh, the Israelites, uh, some of the tribes realized that uh, they didn't have as much land as they thought they would have. The lands were, uh, the, 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 the different you know, uh, parts of the land were allotted to the different tribes. And some of the tribes started to complain. They say, well, it seems like, um, you know, you don't take into consideration the fact that we are a big tribe. Uh, we need more place uh, to live in. Uh, but their problem, in fact, was not a lack of space. Uh, it was something else. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 7 and verse 1 and verse 2, the scripture reads, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hast cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor shew mercy unto them. Now God's command to the Jewish people, to the, Israel, to the Israelites, was very simple. When you conquer the land, you don't sign no contracts with those that you have conquered. You don't show mercy to the people you have conquered. You destroy them and you wipe them out and you drive them out completely. But we find early in the passage in Joshua that that was not the case. In Joshua chapter 17 and verse 13, again, the scripture reads, Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxed and strong, now listen to this, they were wax and strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. So here we've got a problem. We've got God giving them very clear instructions and the Israelites failing once again uh, to heed uh, those instructions. All they had to do uh, was destroy the inhabitants of the land and they would have had more space, but they didn't. Um, in fact, if you go to the book of Judges in chapter 1, uh, verse 27, uh, you read, Neither did Manasseh uh, drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns. And if you go down a couple of verses down to Judges in chapter 1 and verse 29 to 33, the scripture reads, Neither did Ephraim, neither did Zebulon, neither did Asher, neither did, did Naphtali. They were complaining about something God had already given them a solution to. So often we suffer uh, from a lack of growth in the Christian life. Because we fail to follow through God's instructions completely. Number one, we fail to utterly drive out the Canaanites because we compromise. You know, folks, sometimes we aren't able to have the victory in the Christian life. We aren't able to grow in the Christian life because we compromise. We 
drive out some of the Canaanites, we destroy some of the Canaanites, uh, but we allow some of the Canaanites to remain. We forsake some sins, uh, but we leave the others to fester. We say, hey, maybe this one isn't too bad. Hey, maybe gossiping is fine. Maybe bitterness is fine. Hey, maybe being a little worldly and behaving just a little bit like the world is fine. I mean, I'm a Christian. You know, I'm not committing adultery or murder. You know, I'm not uh, gambling or partying like the world. Uh, you know, the Canaanites that still remain in my life uh, are not too bad. You know, I'm not like that other brother or that other sister. Uh, I'm not like uh, that believer who left church. I'm not like this person who, who goes to church only once a year during Christmas. Uh, I'm not like this, this guy who divorced his wife or this lady that divorced her husband and so on. Um, you know, I'm not like one of them. Uh, my Canaanites, the Canaanites in my part of town aren't as bad as the Perizzites in their part of town. You see, instead of driving out, instead of staying away from sin, we start making compromises. Uh, we, we, we have uh, the clear instructions of God to stay away from sin, to eschew sin, to flee from sin. And yet we look at some of these Canaanites and we say, hey, well, you know, these Canaanites are not too bad. One of the reasons we fail to grow is because we compromise. Another reason we fail to utterly drive out the Canaanites is that we think we have it under control. In the book of Joshua, in chapter 17 and verse 13 again, the scripture reads, Yet it came to pass, when the children of Israel were waxen strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute. Well, you know, I, I know the Bible says it's sin, uh, but I'm not overdoing it. I have it under control. I can always leave it if I want. I behave like the world once in a while when, I, when I'm at work, work with my colleagues or uh, uh, when I'm in school with my friends. But you know something? Uh, my Canaanites, the sin... The sins in my life are my slaves. They are my tributaries. They do what I tell them to do. To do, I can switch, it, switch them on and I can switch them off. You know, I can revert to my Christian self when I leave my office. You know, well, I can watch all sorts of shows on TV, but hey, I can always cut it off. You know, I can gossip every once in a while, but I can always stop when I want to. The problem, though, is that Canaanites refuse to be slaves. Eventually, they'll want to take over. You know, a couple of preachers have said, and this is, of course, a pretty common statement, but it's a statement that uh, is very accurate. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. There is no sin that can remain in your life without it eventually taking over. None. You know, the same Canaanites that the, Israel, that the Israelites would, would allow to remain in the land, the same Canaanites that the Israelites thought they could make tributes of would eventually cause the Israelites to sin against God. This same Canaanites would cause the Israelites to go into idolatry. This same Canaanites would cause the Israelites to go into sin. And these same Canaanites would oppress the Israelites. Folks, one of the reasons we fail to grow as Christians is because we have such a low view of sin. You know... We live in an age where we have a bigger, where lukewarm Christianity is mainstream Christianity. You know, people look at Christianity and they are no longer amazed uh, by the Savior because they don't see the power of the Savior, uh, the Savior's work in our own lives. Uh, they look at 
many people who call themselves Christian, who live their lives in such a lackluster, in such a, 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 a superficial fashion. And, uh, and Christians seem to be content with that. You know, they seem to, 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 be, to enjoy uh, consoling themselves with the fact that, hey, I go to church every week, and hey, I go to a couple of Bible studies, and because of that, uh, I'm a good, growing Christian. My friends, we oftentimes uh, don't grow in, in, in Christ. We oftentimes don't grow in the faith because we compromise with sin. Because we compromise with sin and because we think that we have our sins under control. You know, we live in an age where having an all-consuming passion for God is deemed like an extreme thing to have. You know, in fact, if you think about it in modern terms, if you think about it uh, in, uh, in uh, a, a sort of humanistic sort of a way, uh, you would say, well, you know, you, you, it's very extreme to enter into a land and to drive every single one out. I mean, that's a pretty extreme command. Uh, that's a pretty extreme thing to have the Israelites do. But that was exactly what God commanded them to do. You see, folks, we don't follow God's instructions because they seem less extreme or we don't disobey them because they seem more extreme. You see, we live in an age where uh, we want to straddle the fence. We want to be, we want to have one leg in the world and one leg uh, in the things of God. And uh, anything that requires you to have both your legs or both your feet in the things of God uh, will sometimes be labeled as extreme, will sometimes be labeled as just too much. Uh, but that is exactly the kind of thing God demands from the Christian a complete annihilation of the Canaanites uh, in our lives. Another reason we fail to cast out our growth inhibitors is that we are just too afraid. In the book of Joshua, in chapter 17 and verse 16, the scripture reads, The children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Beth Shean and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. The real problem wasn't the lack of space. The real problem was fear. You see, the Israelites had the promise of God. The Israelites had the clear promise of God that they would have the victory over the inhabitants of the land. And in fact, they did have a lot of victory. The Bible tells us that they were waxen strong. But there was something the Israelites couldn't quite get over. And that was the iron chariots, the chariots of iron. But the irony about this, if you think about it, is this. I thought that the Canaanites were tributaries. I thought the Canaanites were under control. I thought the Canaanites were there simply because you thought they would be no harm to you. But there's a problem. They were afraid of their chariots. Are they really tributaries? Or are you just consoling yourself? So often we are just afraid of directly confronting our sin. We are afraid of not being able to give up the very sins we console ourselves, uh, we can control. You know, I can choose not to watch that drama. Uh, it's not a very wholesome drama. Well, stop watching it then. You know, I just have to, you know, you say I can stop watching that drama anytime I want. But then on the, on the day the drama airs, you say, oh, I just got to know uh, what happens next. You know, we are afraid to face our sins because we know at the back of my, our mind that it's not in control. We know that if we are truly honest with ourselves, we are going to have to utterly destroy even the Canaanites with the iron chariots. You know, they come to Joshua with a problem. They say the problem is we don't have enough space. But the real problem is 
They had Canaanites with iron chariots that they were too afraid to displace and take, let, let, and take land from. You see, sometimes we think we have a problem. But at the end of the day, what we think is our problem is not really our problem. The problem is something else. Sometimes we think, you know, I want to grow as a Christian and maybe it's, uh, it's uh, the church's fault that, you know, maybe they're not giving me enough uh, food and that's why I'm not growing. Sometimes you say, oh, maybe, I, maybe God is not, uh, you know, grooming me enough. He's not allowing me to grow enough. Uh, you know, we blame everything and everyone, but we forget that perhaps our problem is something else entirely. Perhaps the reason we don't grow is because we're just afraid to destroy and drive out the Canaanites in our lives. Number one, we fail to grow because we fail to drive out the growth inhibitors. We fail to drive out the Canaanites because we're afraid of their chariots, because we compromise, and because uh, we, we think that we have it under control. Number two, we fail to grow when we think we are the exception. You know, I once heard a drug addict in an interview. He was asked why he started drugs. You know, he had witnessed his the, the, the ruined lives of his friends. Uh, he, had his, he had family members who had lost their lives to drugs, who, you know, who, who spent their lives going in and out of prison. And uh, he had seen uh, his family members addicted to drugs. And he was asked why he started. And his answer was simple and I think representative of what we uh, are all like. His answer was, well, I thought it would be different with me. I thought I could try it, and I thought I could give it up. I thought I could dabble in it, and it would not take me as far as it took other people. Let me be frank with you this morning. If you have been in church for a good number of years, it is quite likely that, the, that most of the principles of godly living and Christian growth aren't new to you, especially if you've been in a Bible-believing, uh, independent, fundamental Baptist church, especially if, if you've been in Shalom. It, it, is, it is quite impossible that you have not been taught uh, to live a godly life. You've not been taught what's required of you uh, to live a godly life. I uh, know you, you've probably heard it over the pulpit. And if quizzed about it, uh, you'd probably be able even to list it out. You know, even children know the song, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Uh, that was a popular uh, Sunday school song, even when I was a kid. And uh, you'd have some actions and you'll say, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And uh, of course, kids uh, want to grow. Uh, every kid wants to be a grown-up. But somehow, we have come to the conclusion, some of us have come to the conclusion uh, that we are a special breed. You know, other people need to do all this stuff to grow, but I'm special. Other people need to chase the Canaanites out completely, but you know, Perhaps I don't have to chase them out completely because, you know, maybe they can't handle sin, uh, but I can. Uh, maybe they can't handle the Canaanites as tributaries, but I can. Uh, maybe they, you know, will, will be pulled down by sin, but maybe I won't. And we think that we are special ones. In the book of Joshua in chapter 17 and verse 14, the book of Joshua in chapter 17 and verse 14, the scripture reads, And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto? You have to understand that Manasseh was a big tribe. And, uh, and, and Ephraim, well, Ephraim was the tribe that Joshua himself belonged to. You know, uh, after the deaths of, uh, 
uh, the the generations that fail, that the, the, the people 20 years old and above in the wilderness. Uh, we find that some tribes lost a good number of people and some tribes gained uh, a good number of people. If my memory serves me uh, correctly, Manasseh, uh, they gained the most number of people. Uh, uh, you know, they had the most number of people added into their tribe. And uh, I think it was Simeon uh, that lost the most number uh, of individuals because of sin and, and judgment upon the tribe and so on. Uh, but generally speaking, these were two big tribes. Manasseh and Ephraim were both uh, sons of Joseph. And they were blessed tribes. And uh, they thought that, well, you know, we, we're pretty big tribes. We are blessed tribes. And surely uh, we are entitled to more land. You know, by the way, they were not given little land. Uh, if you look at the slide, you will see the division uh, of land amongst the different tribes. Now, Manasseh, they had land allocated to them to them on both sides of the Jordan. And even Ephraim had a pretty good piece of land uh, right, um, you know, uh, right at the center. In fact, uh, Shiloh was located in uh, Ephraimite territory. Uh, Shiloh was where the tabernacle was. Uh, Shiloh was where the tabernacle stood. And uh, that was a, a, a matter of great honor that it was located in Ephraimite uh, territory. They were given a good amount of land. and um, But the tribes of the sons of Joseph thought that because God had blessed them uh, thus far, that they should have special treatment. Let me be very clear about something. When it comes to Christian growth, when it comes to blessing in the Christian life, you and I are no exceptions when it comes to God's Word. You can be a pastor. You can be a BSE teacher. You can be a song leader. You can be a, a you know, a someone God has blessed richly with great wealth. Uh, but let me, let me just be clear. You are no exception to the principles that God has laid down in the Bible, con, you know, uh, that relates to Christian growth and having a victorious Christian life. You have to drive out the Canaanites in your land, no matter who you are. Folks, God is no respecter of persons. The, principle, the, the principles that apply to Paul and Joshua apply to us we are special in many ways to the lord i'm sure the lord has built us all in a unique way and uh, i'm sure we the lord loves us all uh, and loves the uniqueness of us all but let me tell you something when it comes uh, to the process of uh, uh, growth it's the same uh, sin will destroy you the way it can destroy anyone else. Uh, we are no different. And one of the reasons why Christians fail to grow uh, is because they think that somehow they can live their lives with a little bit of sin without the word of God. They can live their lives in a lukewarm fashion. And somehow, if only they attend a couple of more sermons, if only they hear a couple of more uh, uh, preachings from some uh, uh, men who can preach really well, uh, that they will grow and become exemplary Christians. You know, Paul spent three years in Arabia before beginning his ministry. There was no shortcut. Show me a Christian who does not spend time in the Word of God. And I will show you a Christian who is still a babe in Christ. You know, we fail to grow when we don't cast out the, in the inhibitors of growth. We fail to grow when we think we're the exception. When we think more is owed to us because somehow we are better than everyone else. And we fail to grow. By the way, folks, this thing about thinking we are an exception, this is a very prevalent thing. And the more I, I consider the lives of so many Christians and why they don't grow, the more I realize how big an issue that really is. We agree with the pastor when the pastor talks about how sin can ruin lives and how sin can keep us away from God and how uh, sin can, uh, you know, not, uh, not staying away from sin and abiding in God's word can cause a stunted growth. 
But whenever we say amen, sometimes we say amen for someone else. It doesn't apply to me. But let me tell you something. It does. And third, we fail to grow when we don't prioritize. You know, another reason we like to think we are the exception is because sometimes we're just pure lazy. Sometimes we're just pure lazy. In the book of Joshua, in chapter 17 and verse 17 and 18, and Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim uh, and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people, and has great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down and the outgoings of it shall be thine. For thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though uh, they be strong. All they had to do if they wanted more land was to simply cut down the trees and destroy the Canaanites. Folks, it was not like God made a mistake. God measured the land and, oh, I didn't give them enough land. Uh, sorry, I, I did the measurement was wrong. I should have given you a little bit extra no, God gave them just the right amount of land. In fact, God gave them ample land. The problem is they didn't like the way God gave it to them. They didn't like the way God gave them that land. They wanted a shortcut. They, they didn't want to have to cut down trees and cast out Canaanites. They wanted shortcuts. Give us land that we don't have to work on. You know, we like to wish that we were spiritual. I hope you like to wish that you were spiritual because that is something we all uh, should wish for. I hope you, you want to be more spiritual and that's a good thing. But sometimes we want to be more spiritual and we want God to magically make us more spiritual, but we don't want to do the work. You know, I heard a story about a man whose family sent him to the doctor uh, because he constantly complained about being too sick to work. The doctor examined his patient and then told him to get dressed and meet him in his office. And when the man came to the office and sat down, he said, Give it to me straight, doc. Uh, don't use any complicated, fancy-sounding medical terms. My family wants the plain truth in plain English. What's wrong with me? All right, the doctor said. I'll make it as plain as I can be. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just lazy. The man sat silent for a moment and then he said, I see. Now will you give me a complicated, fancy-sounding medical term I can tell my family? You know, some people would do anything to be able to do nothing. And uh, that is so true. Uh, so often we want God to make us spiritual, but we don't want to do the work that he has given us to do. We're just plain lazy. You see, there was no shortcut uh, to solving their problem. They had to clear the woods and drive out the Canaanites. There is no shortcut to Christian growth. You've got to cut down the trees and drive out the Canaanites. You know, there's nothing wrong with trees, right? Trees are good. Trees offer shade, they're beautiful. You know, you walk around the park and uh, you see some beautiful trees. And uh, trees are, are, you know, beautiful creation of God. But too many of them around you will hinder you from building your home. You know, there are people out there who say, oh, no, don't cut the trees down because, you know, you're destroying the environment. And, you know, well, if we've got to build homes, sometimes we've got to cut trees down. And that's fine. That's fine. And uh, all of us know that there are some things that uh, we have to do. Sometimes you get to a place and you want to set up a home. If there's too many trees, you cut some trees. Because it's more important than you have a home, than you have trees you can't do much about. You know, all of us know that there are some things that are essential for Christian growth. And oftentimes uh, we look at the, even the harmless things in life, the harmless trees uh, that we have around, and when there are just too many, we're not able uh, to build a home. Uh, but uh, there are some things that we all know are essential uh, for Christian growth. And in 1 Peter in chapter 
chapter 2 and verse 2, the scripture reads, As newborn babes uh, desire ye the sincere milk of the word, uh, that ye may grow thereby. You know, the Bible is your nutri grow. It is your enlin. It is your fern leaf. It is your enfagro. It is your similac. Now, some of you here don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but for you mothers, you know uh, that I, uh, I'm talking about baby formula. You know, the scripture is your baby formula. You know, the baby formula market is more than $50 billion. It's, it's, a, it's a more than $50 billion market, and it's projected to double in about five years. Uh, and parents, even the parents who aren't as affluent, uh, will do all they can to buy the best formula they can for their kids. Now, let me tell you folks something. Reading books is good. Listening to sermons is good. Uh, having fellowship with brethren is good. Uh, but nothing, but nothing will aid you in, in your Christian growth uh, the way the scriptures will aid you. The only, uh, 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 the only sure source of milk for the Christian is uh, the Bible. You know, I said this last week and I say it again. If you have been a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ for more than a few years and you have not read your Bible from cover to cover, then there is something uh, very wrong. If you're not reading your Bible daily, something uh, is very wrong. Uh, if, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you're not spending time with the Lord every day, something is very wrong. And some of you, some of you say, Brother Christian, I just don't have the time. You know, God is not going to give you more than 24 hours. Just as the lot was given to Ephraim and Manasseh, we have been given a lot of 24 hours. And uh, we say we don't have enough time. You're not, we're not going to get more than 24 hours. We've got to cut the trees and cast out the Canaanites. Uh, drive out the Canaanites, you know. If you have to cut back on work, cut back on work. If you've got to cut back uh, on, 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 on recreation, cut back on recreation. You know, folks, something's got to give. Something has got to give. You know, if you find that there are too many trees and you don't have space to build your home, are you just going to sit there and say, oh, there are too many trees. I can't do much about it. I'll just sit down under one of the trees. No. Something has got to give. You know, if you've got to give up your hobby or your recreational time to read the Bible, then do that. But if you want space, you've got to cut the trees. Oh, but I only watch TV for 20 minutes a day. Well, if that's got to give, that's got to give. If you've got to give up 20 minutes of TV for 20 minutes of time with God, then you'll give it up. You know why? Because people give up things for what's important to them. People make sacrifices. Do you know that every day we make sacrifices? We sacrifice something for other things that we feel are more important uh, for us. No mother ever says, I was too busy to feed my child. No mother says, I'm ever too busy to feed my baby. No one says, I was too busy, I forgot to eat for the past three days. You're not too busy to shower, you're not too busy to eat. But even if you were, you'd make yourself less busy. But somehow, reading the Bible just can't be fit in. Somehow, prayer can't be fit into our lives. Let me tell you something, and listen to this carefully. You will never, and I mean this, you and I will never, ever just chance upon time to have with God. We will never just happen to stumble upon time to have with God. You've got to make time to have with God. And, uh, and that is one of the reasons why Christians don't grow. Because they can spend years without having quality time with the Lord. And I just don't know how that's possible. But that, that happens. You know, folks, your kids need the Bible too. 
You know, if you've got to cut away a few trees in your own backyard that your unbelieving friends have lying around in their backyards, then you've got to cut them down. You know, it always amazes me how kids have time to attend five enrichment classes. You know, I, I'm not saying enrichment classes are bad. I think they're great if your child has the time and, you know, if your child uh, needs the classes and you're able to provide them with classes that will help them, you know, you know, become better at what they're doing and better with their learning. I think that's great. Go ahead. But if you're sacrificing time with God, if you're sacrificing Bible time, just so your kid can attend an extra class here and there, then you know what? Sometimes I think we've just got our priorities wrong. Parents say, oh, my kids are so busy. We live in a stressful world. They don't have time for their Bible. And then when the kid grows up, they complain that the kid is just like the world. The Bible says in the book of Matthew in chapter 13 and verse 7, And some fell among thorns, talking about the seeds that were sown. And the thorns sprung up and choked them. In verse 22, we, get, we are told what these uh, thorns are. He also that received the seed, the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. You know, some of us don't grow because the thorns of this world just choke us. The thing is, we sometimes don't realize it until it's too late. You know, it's rarely one big thorn that chokes us, right? It's rarely one big thing. Most of the time, we can't grow uh, because of the small thorns, or the habits we develop, the day-to-day -day cares that take away uh, from the things of God. You know, just as the unchecked day-to-day -day things can, of the world can keep us away uh, from God, keep us in a state of stunted growth, uh, only a day-to-day -day communion with God can help a Christian grow. So often we talk about revival, right? We, we Christians love revivals. We talk about, oh, there was this great revival meeting and the preacher was, oh man, the, the sermons were just point on and the, and the, the, God, the messages were, were spectacular and on and on and on we go. Don't get me wrong, revivals are great. I love revival meetings and I think there's a place in the Christian walk for revivals. But revivals, my friends, don't cause growth in the Christian life. A revival might, might wake you out of a coma. A revival might just, you know, perhaps just slap you out of, 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 uh, of uh, a state of uh, doing absolutely nothing. But a Bible conference every now and then will not cause a growth spurt. You don't grow milk, my friends, from drinking milk once a week. You don't grow from having the occasional extra nutritious baby formula. You grow from daily feeding. One of the reasons we don't grow is because we treat spiritual growth very differently uh, than we do spiritual growth or our physical growth. And uh, we need our physical bread, but we also need our spiritual bread. In the book of Luke in chapter 4 and verse 4, and Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. You know, folks, the solution is already here. Cut down the trees and drive out the Canaanites. But so often, we fail to grow because we compromise. Because we say, oh, you know, these Canaanites aren't as bad. Because we think we have it all under control. We think we can have the sin serve us. And so we say, I'm not going to drive out the sin, but I'm going to, I can control it. I can use it for when I want. When it's convenient, I'll use it. I can switch it on and switch it off. And then you realize, actually, you're not controlling the sin. The sin's controlling you. And then you look at the iron chariots of that sin. Look, I'm not trying to allegorize this story, but I'm trying to show you some practical implications. Just as the uh, Israelites had their enemies to fight, we have our enemies to fight. The enemies of sin, of complacency, of apathy, of the things of God. And sometimes we fail to grow because we do the exact same things they did with their enemies. 
we compromise, we think we have it under control, we are afraid to face our, our sins head on. We think we are the exception. Everyone else must follow the principles of the Bible, but hey, if I don't, it's okay because I've got things under control. And then we don't make things a priority. We, we prioritize the things of the world and then we want to magically grow into giants of the faith. My friends, we expect God to make us, miraculously make us grown, mature Christian, but that's not going to happen. You've got to put in the work. You've got to drive out the Canaanites. You've got to cut down the trees of, of busyness uh, that keep you away from the things of God. And you've got to make a decision. I'm going to conquer all that God has given me to conquer. My friends, if you find that after 10 years you have not grown in the Christian life, my intention today is not to browbeat anyone. It's not to, to say, oh, you know, and just preach on sin and make you feel better. No, no, that's not the intention. My goal is this. Have you checked how far you've grown. If you saw your spiritual life, will you say it has prospered as much as your physical life? My friends, I think it is time for us to have an honest evaluation of ourselves. Not to check if, oh, am I saved, am I not saved? No, but to check if we're still babes. If after 20 years you're still drinking baby formula, Something's very wrong. It's no longer cute. Frankly, it's quite disgusting. It's quite sad. So for those of you that are watching that are believers, I pray that uh, we will not remain satisfied with the stunted growth. It should worry us. It should move us. It should wake us. There's ample space to grow and thrive. We just need to know to cut the trees and drive out the Canaanites. For those of you who have not heard of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't drive out the Canaanites until you've left Egypt. 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ came down, God the Son, to, to die for your sins and mine. My friends, when God created the world, He created a perfect world. He created a world uh, with perfect human beings, but man chose to disobey God. Man chose to sin, and because God is a holy God, he cannot have sin before him. He has to judge sin. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So 2,000 years ago, God sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die in your place and mine. He took the punishment that was rightly due us, and if only we trust his payment for us, and his payment alone, we will get to heaven. If you understand today that you're a sinner and you're willing to put your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation, you will be saved. My friends, do not delay because we don't know when we'll take our last breath. Today might just be the last chance you have to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'd like to know more about this simple gospel message, Please do contact us uh, on our website. We have our contact details on the YouTube page and we'd be happy uh, to get back to you. But for the rest of us that are Christians, it's time for us to cut down some trees. It's time for us to drive out those Canaanites. And it's time for us to grow in the Lord. Have a blessed week, a wonderful week, and uh, I, I, I will see you all uh, next week or we are please keep the uh, the church in prayer uh, we would uh, probably be uh, recording the next few sermons and uh, we always uh, pray that uh, the Lord will continue to uh, use us even at this time let us close with a word of prayer Heavenly Father most high God we thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity, uh, Lord, to even bring thy word to thy people. Uh, Lord, I commit uh, each and everyone that's watching this video from um, 
home that you'll be with them. Uh, Lord, that you'll impress upon their heart the need to grow in thee. We ask that you bless them, and even uh, with this COVID situation, uh, that you, Lord, uh, we know that you're fully in control. We pray that you will continue to uh, be with each and every believer, that you will help us to have uh, the faith, Lord, that uh, is befitting believers in Jesus' name. Amen.